Standing for light like me And I saw darkness run for cover But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven I believe now, say Signs and wonders Say it, I have resurrection power, say Resurrection power Still the miracle Still the miracle That I just can't get over My name is registered Oh, say it, my praise My praise Our redemption church Let's sing it out, everybody This is my testimony From dead to life Cause Christ rewrote my story Today, say, yeah, yeah, sing the praise, everyone. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Oh, yes, it will today. Our God, our God will finish what He started. Oh, this is, this is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. If you know this word to be true, let's sing it together. If I'm not, if I'm not dead, you're not done. We declare greater things, greater things still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Every voice see it, I'll say. Greater things still to come. Oh, I, if I'm not, if I'm not dead, you're not done. You're not done. You're That's right, church. Come I'm on, let's testify today. By Jesus Christ, the righteous, I'm justified. Yeah. This is my testimony. This is, yeah. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause Christ rewrote my story.
how many of you can feel God in this room this morning? You know, the reason why a song like that is so important, we say, God, welcome into this space right here, right now. Because when God shows up, certain things have to go. Because where God is, sickness cannot be. And this may sound so simple to the wisest man in this room, to the wisest woman in this room, but I got news for you. That shame that you're dealing with has to go right now in the name of Jesus. That fear, that anxiety, that panic that you have not shared with your family has to go right now because God is in this place. And if you find yourself struggling, if you find yourself, it's like, man, I hear you. I hear what you're saying. Y'all say it so confidently, but I don't know if it's for me. I got news for you. It is for you today. All you got to do is begin to lift your hands, lift your voice. God, I give you this. God, I give you my fear. God, I give you my anxiety. God, I give you my pain. And I say, welcome into this place. And with that in mind, we're going to get ready to roll out a brand new song this morning. So if you would just lift your hands just like this, and it's all about the fact that there is absolutely nothing that can separate you from the goodness and from the love of God. Y'all believe that this morning? That neither height nor death, no trial, no tribulation, nothing in the past, nothing in the present can separate us from God's love. It's a brand new song, so just lift your hands. Let's do it together. Here we go. It's like this. And I made sure that if I keep my eyes on you, this mountain can be used to get a better view. And I'm persuaded that even in the darkest part, the light of love reaches my heart to bring me back to you. We're never separated. If there's no fear or hesitation, I love this. So come try or tribulation. This is the chorus. Nothing will keep me from you. Somebody say, nothing will keep me from you. And I'll go through. If the road will lead me to the day I find my rest in you, where I It's in remembrance of you, of your relief pursuit to bring me back to you. Now we are never separated. We're never separated. Say there's no fear. There's no fear. Oh, there's a So come trial or tribulation. So come trial or tribulation. Nothing safe. Nothing's in our way this morning Not my shame, not my pain And so I take that and I speak to the mountain So I speak to mountains Standing in my way His love reaches me Nothing separates I am confident In the words you say Nothing will Come on, say, I speak to mountain. I speak to mountain. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Say his love. Oh, yes, nothing said. And I am confident. Come on. I am in love. In the words you say, nothing will keep me. All right, church.
chorus one more time. Give me a voice. Did nothing will keep me. Give me a voice. From you, nothing will keep me. From you, nothing will keep me. From you, nothing will keep me. God, we thank you.
him and him alone. We build a place for him to inhabit, for him to come, for him to sit on. Do you sense his presence? Do you know that he's here? You built it. You built a place for him with your praise and your worship. Right here in this moment, I want to pray for those that you just couldn't build anymore. You tried, it just, you can't because you remember the fallen things. If you're in that place right now, will you just, with every eye closed, will you just lift up your hand and just say, God, I need you to come and lift me up. There's hands going around. There's hands of honesty saying, God, I, I want more of you, but I'm, it's, it's I'm fallen. I can't find it. Let God come right now and take you back to that moment when fear crept into your heart. Let him take you back to that memory long ago that you buried. Let him take you back to those words that you heard that you wish you never could hear or the things you saw that you wish you never or the things you did that you wish you never done. Let him take you back to that place and let him raise it up. He can uphold you with his right hand. He can lift you higher. He came down to us so he could lift us up to where he was. We are supposed to be seated with him in heavenly places. So let us set our minds on the higher things. As we close this moment out, if there's anybody here that does not have Jesus living in your heart, he can't kick out the walls of your, of your house and of your life because you never let him in. He can't extend something he doesn't dwell in yet. Will you make him a place to dwell? If you have not said, Jesus, come and dwell in me, be my Lord and Savior, and you want that, you need that, you know that it's your time right now, will you just raise your hand and say, that's me? Even if it's just one, that's me. I need God to dwell in my heart. I need to be saved. I need to be saved. I need Jesus to come into my heart. One hand, two hands, three hands. God's doing a miracle in you. Let's pray this prayer together. This is how you bring Jesus into your life. Dear Jesus, repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I've fallen short of your glory. But today, I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that you died and that you rose again. And today, I declare that you are my savior and you are my Lord. And I will follow you all the days of my life. You're doing a new thing in me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We put your hands together to those who are saved for those things that God did. Can we just celebrate a little more in this nine o'clock service? We praise you, we thank you. You are so good, you are so mighty. We seal this time with praise into your name, in Jesus' name, amen. If you just made the decision to follow Jesus, your life will never be the same. Don't take this walk of faith alone, so let us know about your decision by texting the number at the bottom of your screen. If this is your first time joining us online, we want to welcome you. Be sure to introduce yourself by texting the number at the bottom of your screen. Are you looking for fellowship and have a desire to build community? Well, signups for Summer Life Group start June 11th, so be sure to save the date. Now, let's head back into service. You know, our virtual community is very important to us, and we go to great lengths. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of people in the room I'm in right now that care so much that they give their gifts, their talents, what they've learned to make sure we can let you feel just as close to our heart as we possibly can. We have to reach through cameras and computers and, and phones and every other way to do it, but we're trying everything we can to get to you. And I just want to say to our entire iChurch community, which are people that are redemption members all over the world, to our Facebook Live community, anybody within our virtual circle, I want to say happy graduation to all of the graduates. We congratulate you, we honor you, and you are at a great time. May God begin to tap into all of your potential and may all of your gifts begin to shine because God has put great things in each and every one of you. So if you're a graduate or you have someone in your family or your circle that is, let them know. Redemption loves them and celebrates them today and so do me and hope. God bless you. 
will always have a big smile on my face during this time because I know it's the time where I get to give back. I can't come in here and praise and worship God and let God bless me and do for me and give to me like he does and me not turn around and reciprocate my love. We all sing about how much God loves us, but how much do we love God? How much do we turn around and love him back? And the Bible says that we're not just to honor the Lord with our praise, we're not just to honor with our worship. The the word says to honor God with our substance with our substance. That is the possessions that he has allowed us to steward. Let me tell you something great about the kingdom. If you are born again, if you're saved, if you're a Christian, you're not just a member of a church, you're not a part of a religious institution, you are a citizen of a kingdom. And in the citizenship of that kingdom, you have the blessings and rights that come with being under that king. All you have to do is obey the instructions. And God has told us if we bring him the tithe and bring him the offering, that the windows of heaven, I've been talking about windows and gates and doors, that the windows of heaven, that he would open those up. Do you know what those windows are? Those windows are me, those windows are you. I want God to open me up. I don't want to, I don't want to die at the end of my life with my dreams still in me. I I don't wanna die with gifts that I never used. I don't wanna die with an anointing that I never tapped into. I don't wanna die with potential that was never realized. I want God to open me up. So there is that dynamic to the blessing of God where God will bless you financially. But the greatest blessing is he said, you are a window from heaven and I'll open you up on the hills of you following this instruction. Oh, I wonder what your life would look like if God opened you up. (laughs) I wonder what your marriage, what your family, what your business, what your career, what, what you would look like if God took everything in you that's been shut, maybe for 10, 20, 30 years and opened you up. You say, Pastor, man, that sounds good. I want to live like that. Well, this is the moment where God opens those windows. Don't let this moment pass you by. There's too many things in you that you've not tapped into that God has never opened up for you to pass by this moment as though just another religious duty. This is a moment where God can change things forever. I believe that and I live it. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you right now that you would just immerse everyone under the sound of my voice in generosity. May we live to give. May we be givers all the time, not just in church, not even just to God, but may we just have a posture of giving. Don't let us be takers. Don't let us just be receivers. Let us learn how to turn around and be blessed enough to give. We bring the tithe and the offering and we do it cheerfully with a smile on our heart and a bell ringing in our soul. Thank you for this opportunity to bless the name of the Lord in Jesus' name and everybody. Said amen, amen, and amen. Come on, it's time to bring our tithe and offering to the Lord. More people have chosen to use text to give as their preferred way of giving because it is safe, quick, and very easy. Here's how it works. Open a new text message on your phone and use your text to give number. Text RCM to 864-920-1282. The very first time you use the service to give, you will receive a text message with a link to a registration form. Click the link in the text and it will direct you to enter your information. You will only have to enter your information once to set up the service. Then it's a matter of seconds to give. It's safe and secure, easy to use, and you will receive an instant receipt. Add your text to give number in your contact list so you'll have it ready. That's it. Giving has never been so easy. And we thank you for your generosity. pursue what God's got for my life, a persecution will come again. Well, who do you think you are? Well, nobody in our family's ever, you need to quit trying to act like you ain't just one of us. Rejoice and be glad because there's a great and effective door awaiting me and there are many adversaries. You will outlive this devil, you will overcome this devil, and in the name of Jesus, you will open a door. 
Well, I hope you guys are ready for the word because we are full blown right in the middle of this series. And uh, man, I've enjoyed it. Gotten a lot of feedback that, that people have learned a lot, that it's been helping people. And if I'm preaching the word and anybody's being helped by it, then I'm doing my job. That's, that's what my assignment is, is to take the word, be a messenger of the word, teach it so that people's life can be blessed and elevated by it. I was just looking at that bumper that you just saw. It was kind of funny. That was 2009 run, and then they flipped to a 2023 run, and there was a whole lot more gray hair in the 2023 version than there was. It was blonde in the 09 version. It was gray in the 2023 version. Uh, that don't have anything to do with what I'm preaching, but I was just looking at it when it was on, and I'm like, man, how time flies. First Corinthians 16 and 9, we're talking about enemies. You say, Pastor, that is a weird subject. I don't know that I've ever heard anybody preach about enemies. Ain't we supposed to be loving people, gracious people, merciful people? Yes, we are. Uh, but if you think that you're going to live life and, and come up against no difficulty, no challenge, if you're not going to have an enemy of your soul, an enemy of your potential, then you're fooling yourself. And if you have not lived out one of those times where you had to address and confront enemies of your future and your potential, just keep living because at some time or another, it's gonna take place in everybody's life. Difficulty does not discriminate. Difficulty does not care how much money you have, where you come from, color your skin, what side of town you were raised on, or what your daddy's last name is. It does not care. Difficulty visits everyone. And so here again, this is preaching that came out of my life in one of my most difficult times, things that God showed me and more of a pathway out. The first part of enemies is talking about who are some of these specific enemies. The latter part of my last few four or five teachings are gonna be how to overcome them. But we're starting at 1 Corinthians 16, 9, and we have been doing that every week. Let's read. For a great and effective door has opened for me, opened to me, excuse me, and there are many adversaries. For a great door, a great door. Great doors require great battles. You do not have ordinary battles and open great doors. If you're gonna open great door, there's always a great giant. There's a great difficulty. If you're gonna open small doors, then there's a small victory to be had. So there's a great and there's an effective door. The door is not only gonna be big, but it's going to make me effective. But in front of every door that is great and in front of every door that is effective, then there are many adversaries. What does that mean? That means this, I think the enemy will let you open little doors all day long. I think, you, I think the enemy will let you open doors that are not really making you effective all day long. But if you're gonna move to greatness, and Genesis 12, God's promise to Abraham that Galatians says through Jesus Christ falls on us, he said, I will make you great. I will make your name great. I will bless you. I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse those who curse you. And you, all the nations of the world shall be blessed. If you're gonna open doors like that, those kind of doors have enemies. Those kind of doors have Goliaths standing in front of them. Those kind of doors have a Pharaoh saying, I'm gonna keep you out. Those kind of doors have walls saying, I'm not gonna let you through. So I want you to open great doors and I want you to open effective doors but doors go hand in hand with adversaries. So Father, bless the reading of your word in Jesus' name and let something happen today that lasts long after we've finished this coming together and worshiping together and hearing this word. In your mighty name I pray and everybody said amen, amen, and amen. We talk to each other at this church to so tell you neighbor on both sides, here we go neighbor, here we go, here we go. You guys been enjoying enemies so far? I hope that you have. I know that I've enjoyed preaching it. Uh, a little bit of review here, not much. I like to take two or three minutes to connect the old with the new. I told you that heaven has windows. I, I talked about that a little bit during the offering time. Heaven has windows and you are the windows of heaven. And when you bring the tithe into the storehouse, that means that God takes you as a window and open you up. That means God has already put heaven on the inside of you. The Bible says, for we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Talked about that last week. 
this treasure in earthen vessels, meaning that God has hidden things in our heart and in our mind. And when he hides it in our heart and mind, he hides it inside this clay. So you can never look at how great and effective somebody is based on what you see, because the treasure is not what you see, the treasure is hidden inside what you see. And some of us misread people all the time because we see the vessel, but we cannot see the treasure. And because the vessel is not very impressive, we think that there must not be much of a treasure. Oh, but the devil is a lie. I believe there is coming a people and I want to be one of them where we can get past looking at the things we don't like, looking at the flaws in people's character, looking at the things in their flesh and still that believe that there is greatness and God can use them. And when you have the ability to look past the vessel and see that God has put inside of it a treasure, that is when true spiritual maturity has begun to dawn on your life. I got to, I got to save some of this. I'm already getting too happy and I'm still in my introduction. So heaven has windows, hell has gates. There are people that are the gates of hell. There are people that give evil permission through them to enter the earth. We're not fighting flesh and blood. We're fighting principalities and powers. We're fighting evil spirits, but evil spirits use gates. And so you think your enemy is the person, but it's not the person. It's the spirit that is using that person. Many times, unbeknown be known to that person that they're even being used for evil. So it looks like someone is standing in the way of your progress, but it's a spirit that stands in the way of your progress that has found a gate that they can move through to try to frustrate your purpose. So we know heaven has windows, hell has gates, we know that life is lived through doors and great and effective doors are opened up to us and there are many adversaries with those doors. If you would, guys, I want you to turn to Luke 19. Luke 19, I got a few scriptures I want to read here. Luke chapter 19. Now, as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Next verse there. He said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Look what he says, verse 13. So he called 10 of his servants together and delivered 10 mina and said to them, do business till I come. Hmm. You may have heard me said before, but I haven't really dug down into this for some time. I want to, I want to dig down in this a moment. Our warfare is not to win. When we praise, we know that praise can be warfare. Worship even can be warfare. Sometimes worship is not all about intimacy with God. Sometimes worship is warfare. You don't even know it, but in your tears, you're pushing back the gates of hell. You're pushing back the forces of darkness. But so many times I hear preachers talk about, you know, God, devil, God, and just listen to their message, and the devil this, and the devil this, and the devil. And I call that a gospel of dualism. And the Bible does not teach a gospel of dualism. Dualism meaning there are two co-equals. There's a good God and a co-equal bad devil and they're fighting every day and you're the prize. That is not the conflict we are in. Let me say it again. That is error and that is not the conflict that we are in. The conflict we are in, I just read to you in Luke 19. When Jesus teaches a parable, he is explaining a spiritual truth that he is hidden behind the curtains of a story. So it's not that Jesus wants you to understand a story about a guy who owns a, a vineyard and comes back and gives to his servants 10 mina and says, I want you to put this to work till I come. It's not about that. It's about you pulling back the curtain of that story and seeing the kingdom principle that is behind it. Remember, the kingdom does not come to the casual. The kingdom comes to the seeker. Seek ye first the kingdom and all these things shall be added unto you. Do you understand? So he said, do business till I come. Another translation, which is better, says occupy till I come. So in other words, Jesus goes to the cross. He defeats Satan. He defeats death, hell, and the grave. They are thoroughly defeated. All victory belongs to him. All authority is, un, is, is unto the Lord. And every knee bows and he goes and sits at the right hand of the Father in a posture of completion. 
There is nothing left for Jesus to do. There are no battles left to win. I want you to know something. You've already won. You're already victorious. You already have peace. You already have joy. You already have prosperity. You already have restoration. It's all there, but we have to occupy it. He didn't say, go win. Go beat the devil till I come back. He said, occupy. What that means is possess what I have already taken for you. It's all already there. Now you've got to go and possess it. So you've got to understand that hell has gates trying to keep you out. You've got to understand Jericho has walls trying to keep you out. You've got to understand Pharaoh's trying to keep you out. You've got to understand Goliath is trying to keep you out. But your job And struggle is to occupy what? Fulfill every promise that Jesus purchased for you on the cross of Calvary till he returns. The Bible says, putting those things which, forgetting those things which are behind me, I press toward the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. There is no such thing in the kingdom as there. There's only a thing called upward. What are you doing? You're continually pressing, continually forgetting, continually pressing, continually forgetting. There'll always be something you've got to let go of and there'll always be something you've got to press for. And when God gets through it the last season, you've got to let go of everything and close the door. And when you press toward the new season, you've got to open some door and you've got to be able to confront some new challenges. Do you understand what I'm saying? Occupy till I come. What? God told Moses at a burning bush, I have given you a land flowing with milk and honey, a barefooted fugitive from justice for 40 years. I have given you. It's done. What took 40 years? It took him 40 years to occupy. Didn't take 40 years to win. God's already won. It took 40 years to occupy what God had done. I always go back to the war in Iraq, no matter politically where you stand on that. I remember in three days, we were pulling down the statue of Saddam Hussein in the downtown streets of Baghdad. We had won that war in three days, but we were there 10 years. Why were we there 10 years trying to occupy it with a democratic government? Just because the battle's over does not mean you have possessed everything you're supposed to possess. Great and effective doors stand in front of you occupying. Occupy till I come. Close doors, fight the next giant. Defeat him, close the doors, fight the next giant. I'm pressing toward the upward call of God in Christ. I keep ascending and I keep ascending and I keep ascending. And that is how life works until the day you die. You never stop forgetting and you never stop pressing. I need somebody in the building to shout amen. Look at your neighbor on both sides and say, he's talking straight to you right now. He's talking straight to you. The second thing I want to tell you, I just felt something of the Holy Ghost. Ah, I just want to prophetically declare right now to some of you who are about to give up and about to quit and say, I cannot open this next door because there's too much tension and there's too much warfare. Let me speak to you right now by the word of the Lord. I hear the Lord saying that your enemy is frustrated at all the warfare he has thrown against you, but he has not been able to stop your progress. I hear the Lord saying right now, (laughs) so many of you are close to the finish line. That is why you feel like giving up in a way that you have never felt like giving up. But I hear the Lord said, press, press, press. I hear him say, praise, praise, praise. Somebody needs to stand up right now and bless the Lord. I hear him saying, shout, shout, shout. I hear him say, jump, jump, jump. I hear the Lord saying, spin, shekataba. I hear him saying, run. And I'm prophetically declaring to you in the midst of you being weary and saying, I'm gonna stop right here. You are right next to that door. I command you to lift up your head because your redemption draweth nigh and open that next door in the name of Jesus. Somebody who needs to press, somebody who needs to jump, somebody who needs to clap. I'm gonna give you 15 seconds to throw a fit right now. Don't you lay down right on the verge of your next season. Hallelujah! Give your God a praise. 
Hallelujah. 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 Don't stop now. Come on, shout again. Shout again. Fill your lungs up with air and shout again. Hey! Hey! Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, open that door. Oh! Open, 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 open. Open, 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 open. Open, 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 open. Some of you, this is the Sunday you open it. Some of you, this is the week you open it. Some of you will open it right now. Some of you will open it tonight. Some of you will open it on the way home. Some of you will open it this week. But your door will open in the name of Jesus. Shout hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. High five three people and say, this door will open. This door will open. I gotta sit back down, give me some time. I need to finish this thing. I need to finish this thing. So that's my first point. My second point is this. The moment, hey, hallelujah. The moment, the moment that your next assignment is revealed the moment your next enemy is revealed. The moment your next assignment is revealed, (coughs) pardon me, is the moment your next enemy is revealed. Matthew chapter four, please. Matthew chapter four. Then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterward, he was hungry, verse three, Now the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. Chapter four doesn't make sense without chapter three. Jesus has just been identified by heaven. Man, for some of you Lone Ranger ministries out there and some of you preachers who called yourself, there has to be two validations of your calling. There has to be an earthly one and there has to be a heavenly one. Okay? Jesus has been working under his father's tutelage as a carpenter. Unseen, the Bible even said there's nothing about his appearance that would grab our attention. Isaiah said that. Seemed like just a normal person. But then he walks into the crowd where John the Baptist is baptizing And here comes the earthly validation. Behold the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. So someone who is a man or a woman of God in the earth has validated the anointing on his life. That happens and then chapter four. Okay. Here comes, excuse me, chapter three. There comes during that baptism then the heavenly validation. The heavens open The Holy Spirit descends on him in bodily form like a dove. And out of the heavens, the Father in heaven says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. So now we have the earthly validation, the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. And we have the heavenly validation. He is the son of God. So after 30 years, his assignment is revealed. For 30 years, we have no record of temptation. We have no record of adversity. We have no record of difficulty. We have no record of a challenge. I can't say it didn't happen, but Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, none of them recorded it if it did. The only thing we do know that when he was a babe, there was a decree put out to kill the sons. Okay? But other than that, we see no adversity. Then once his assignment is revealed, this is the son of God 
heavenly, earthly, the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. Boom, all of a sudden the sheet is pulled off Jesus and he's no longer hidden. Who he is in the earth now has been revealed. Satan says, I got to test that. And the Bible says, and the tempter came. And look at how he tempted him, if you are. Because temptation is never over what you're doing. Temptation is over always your identity. Why do you think we have such identity confusion in this generation? They call it dysphoria. Listen, not only do people not know purpose, people do not know identity. They right now can't even tell what gender they are. Why? Because Satan never comes to tempt what you're doing. He comes to tempt who you are. Who are you? And right now we have a generation that would respond, I don't know. <clears throat> if you are the son of God, if you are the son, if you are the son, of God, it's always about who you are. So the first thing that you've got to realize is your warfare, the enemies that are trying to keep you out, it's occupational warfare. The second thing you've got to understand is whenever your assignment, your next door, your next assignment is revealed, your next enemy is revealed. <clears throat> they always go hand in hand. Let me move forward here. Third thing, man, my time's gotten away from me. Somebody say, help him, Lord. I've got pages and pages of notes here and I'm trying to figure out where to go. <clears throat> Exodus 13. The third thing I want to tell you about enemies is when your enemy is revealed, the greatest thing you could do is obey an instruction. Most of the time, your next door and your next advancement will be paralleled by an instruction. Exodus 13, verse 7. <clears throat> then it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God did not lead them by the land of the Philistines, although that was near. In other words, it was the closest route. For God said, lest perhaps the people change their mind when they see war and return to Egypt. Lest the people change their mind when they see war and return to Egypt. Let me say something right here. Good God, there's so much. Help me, Jesus. Some of you wonder why destiny takes so long. Let me read further. I'm getting the cart before the horse. Let me read further. Go on to verses, where did I tell you go? Well, I don't know what the next one is. Just go to the next one. I think it might have been verse five. Now it was told to the king of Egypt that the people had fled and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants were turned against. Actually, the King James says, and God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Ah. When God wants to speed up the process, he will harden the heart of your enemy. Because hardening the heart actually means in Hebrew, whatever you're going to do, go ahead and do it speedily. So in other words, Pharaoh, if you're going to try to frustrate their purpose and them moving out of bondage into their promised land, whatever you're going to do, go ahead and do it quickly. Let me finish verse five. Keep it up there just a minute if you would. And then we'll go on to the next one. I'm not sure which ones I gave you, but whatever order they are, I'll read them in that order. Turn the servants against the people and they said... Why have we done this that we have let Israel go serving us, from, from serving us? Why is Pharaoh and the people now mad? Pharaoh told them they could go worship. Pharaoh told them, go out and worship your God. Do whatever you want to. But the Bible says when they left, they plundered the Egyptians because God gave them favor with the Egyptians. So the Egyptians were emptying their pockets and emptying their households with treasures of silver and gold. Israel walked out of Egypt with the gross national economy of Egypt in their pockets. And let me tell you something about the enemy. The enemy will let us come in our building and he will let us <laughs> run our laps and shout and jump up and down and play our music and throw around our lights. As long as when we leave, nothing has happened, our life has not grown and he still owns everything. 
The devil is a lie. And Pharaoh wanted to chase them and the people wanted to chase them. Why? Because this time they didn't just leave and go worship. This time they left with all of Egypt's possessions. And when you go into the kingdom of darkness and take the stuff back that God wanted you to have the whole time, that's when the enemy's heart's hardened. But if the heart's, if the enemy's heart's been hardened and the intensity against you has been increased, that only means you're going to get to your victory faster. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hey, blessed be the name of Jesus. I can't start that right now. Yeah. Oh, I got so many things. Hold on a minute. Let me, let me quote some others. Less when they see war, they change their minds. Faith does not come by what you see. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God gives promises. Faith arises. And then your eyes see something contradictory. That's what the Bible calls double-minded. Double-minded don't mean you got two heads. Double-minded means you got what God told you in your heart and what you're seeing with your eyes and you're conflicted between the two because you don't know which one to believe. And the Bible says in James 1 that a double-minded man is unstable. You can't walk with those people and you can't be best friends with those people because they're unstable in all of their ways and they should think that they shall receive nothing from the Lord. Who? So you can't sort of believe God. You got to believe him. <clears throat> you got to believe God. Now listen to what he said. I've already given them their land, the door. But if they see warfare, what were the Philistines? What was Goliath? A giant. They'll change their mind. For a great and effective door is open for me, but there are many adversaries. The giant is there to intimidate you from opening the door. First Timothy 5 says, for we have not been given the spirit, we say of fear, but spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. But the NIV says the spirit of timidity, and that, that word timidity is a more accurate translation. For God did not give us the spirit of timidity, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. What is timidity? The root word of timidity is timid. Timid is the, is the root word for intimidation. Intimidation is not your enemy being victorious. Intimidation is your enemy so convincing you that you can't win that you don't even engage. I am preaching. So there's a great and effective door. But there's an enemy. And the enemy's bark is much worse than his bite. Hallelujah. Somebody shout with me, hallelujah. His bark is much worse than his bite. Lest they see warfare and change. Lest they see warfare and become double-minded. Do I believe what God said or do I believe what's in front of my eyes? The just shall live by faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. And there's been too many times for me, too many biblical examples, stay with me here, that once you've been given a promise, the enemy will try to make an assault on your senses. Lord, Peter said, if it's you walking on the water, bid me to come to you. Jesus said, come. He gets out of the boat and he starts walking. And the headline in your Bible says, Peter walks on the water. Peter did not walk on the water. Translators are amazing people. They put those headlines there, but that is not what he walked on. If Peter would have got out and walked on water, he'd have sunk straight to the bottom. He walked on word. 
because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. And when Jesus told him the word that he could come, then that word was able to sustain him in a place where he would normally sink. Who am I talking to? So he walked on word. But then the Bible says, as he was walking out the word, thank you, Lord. He saw the wind and the waves and he began to sink. It isn't that he didn't believe that Jesus said come to him. It's that he became double-minded and I'm not sure which I believe now because the word is telling me to walk but the wind and waves are looking like they're here to take me out. And a double-minded man, see, he don't have to get you to fully disbelieve God. He just got to make you consider The Bible says that Abraham, although his body was as good as dead, when God said, I'm going to make you the father of nations, he was already a hundred and his body was good as dead and that Sarah's womb at 90 years old was closed. But he did not consider the fact. Woo! Truth does not consider facts. He did not consider the fact that his body was as good as dead, but However, he believed God and was fully persuaded that what God said he was able to perform. You got to understand that when your assignment is revealed, your enemy is revealed. And then the greatest thing you can do is obey an instruction. Because then the enemy will show you right before this instruction that brings you the victory, the enemy will try to intimidate you and say, you can't win this. This is not a door you can open. Next verse, please, in Exodus that I had given you to read. I didn't have them written down right. And the Lord hardened Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel, and Israel went out with boldness. The next verse that I had for you, please. Y'all do such a great job in the back. Thank you. Is this not the word that you were told in Egypt saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness? Verse 13. And Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more. That makes me want to jump down off the stage, run around this building 10 times and dive right through that camera lens for those of you who are virtual and turn over chairs for everybody in the building. Why? Because not only does God want you to send this battle, you got to understand when you defeat this enemy and you open this door, this enemy is never supposed to come back in your life again. Do some of you understand that if you can just win this next battle, that this enemy that you are seeing will never revisit you, never spring back up in your life because God is wanting to give you a complete victory, not a partial victory. And some of you keep fighting the same scenery and the same devil and the same cycle. But I came today with the word of the Lord unto you. This enemy you have seen, you shall see no more. Somebody who wants this enemy to leave forever, stand on your feet and give God 10 seconds of praise. No more. No more, 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 no more. I need you to turn to everybody in your circle and say no more, no more, no more. Shout no more one more time. That is what God is wanting to do in this next battle. Next verse, please. You can stand up, sit down, no matter to me. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Now that's what he said to the people. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? (laughs) It's isn't funny. But I'm a leader and I know what that means. What it means is Moses got in front of the people. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And then after he left, he's like, oh God, they're going to kill us. (laughs) what he was saying to the people and what he was saying to God were two different things. (laughs) Excuse me, but I've been there. Bold as a lion with the anointing on me in in the midst of God's people, amening and everyone agreeing together. 
and then walk out the back door and it's like all your courage just drops out of your body. This verse right here, let me read it again. Tell the children of Israel to go forward. Next verse, please. Lift up your rod, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. I'm going to end right there. If you would play something for me, DJ. Please don't tune me out now and start getting your pocketbook and picking up your stuff and getting ready to get your kids. If you're watching virtually, getting ready to pick up your phone and start thumbing through Instagram. Stay right here a minute. This is going to be hard for some of you to hear, but I got to say it just like you said. When your your assignment is to occupy, your warfare is occupational, there's something designed to keep you out from possessing. That's the first point. Second point is when your door is revealed, your enemy is revealed. The third point is whenever you come up on your enemy, there'll always be a divine instruction that you have to obey. And God told Moses, it's time for you to quit talking to them. Now listen to this. It's time for you to quit crying to me. It's time for you to go. And some of us are good at talking to people and we're good at even talking to God, but we're not good at going. Take your hand and stretch out the rod and watch God part the seas and watch the people go over on dry ground. A divine instruction. How silly to look at a sea and take a stick and hold it in the air and God will solve your problem. Take a stick and hold it in the air and I will remove your enemy from the face of the earth. That's ridiculous. I cannot tell you how many instructions that seemed ridiculous. I could sit here right now and take three hours telling you stories of ridiculous instructions. And the moment that I obeyed that instruction, my enemy was vanquished and my door opened. Proverbs 1 says that the fool is defined by this the refusal to obey an instruction. And some of you right now in this enemy's teaching, you're past the talking to other people stage and you're past the praying stage because faith without works is dead. It's time to engage. For Moses, it was taking that stick and stretching it out. What is it for you? There is a divine instruction. Let me tell you something. We sing and talk about, we we have a generation that all we want to talk about is the love of God. And can you ever talk about that enough? I don't think so because God is love. But my peace, my purpose, my prosperity, me occupying, me opening doors, will not be accomplished because of God's great love for me, but it will be accomplished by how much I love God. There's a lot of people that God loves that are living way outside of their purpose because they don't love God back. Instruction, shake it Instruction, help me Holy Ghost, and correction is the proof God still cares. Instruction and correction is the proof God still cares. Let me tell you something, the greatest thing anybody on my staff can do is obey an instruction. Because if they obey an instruction, they can't fail because they failed or they succeeded to obey the instruction. Whether or not the instruction failed or succeeded is on me. When you obey God, the success is not on you. The success is on God. 
whether or not you succeeded is whether or not you obeyed. The most stress relieving thing in the world I can do is to obey an instruction. Because once I obey the instruction, the success of it is no longer my responsibility. It's God's. I want to right now release a liberty in the house for people to come be prayed for, be prayed with, and some people just need to come seek God. Some of you have your instructions and you know what God is telling you to do and you're rebelling. Some of you, it's just straight up rebellion. That's a fool. Not defined by Ron, but by the Word of God. Number two, some of you know you've been given an instruction, but you're not in rebellion, you're in fear. That'll look stupid. What will people think? Will it really work? What if it doesn't? It's not up to you. It's up to you to obey. And some of you are past talking and past praying and you're awaiting an instruction. And this day is prophetic because this is the day God wants to give it. So there's a group that's got it and you're in rebellion. You just have a hard heart against God. You're just like, well, God, I'm not doing it. Number two, You want to do it, but you're scared. Number three, you don't know what the instruction is. I want you to come down here if you belong in one of them three groups. Come on, come on, come on, come on. I don't like people who wait and reason out altar calls. I like to see people who jump out in the aisle and come down there because they know that God is speaking to them. Come, 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 come. Pastor Robert, I want you to come up here if you would, take over. Pastor Ashley and others on our church, I want you to go ahead and begin ministering people. Come, 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 come right now because today is the day of doing in Jesus' mighty name. Come on down here. The instruction is about to be given and we're gonna obey and we're gonna walk across through our enemy on dry ground. Hallelujah. Do you have an amazing dad? Well, we want to hear about him. So be sure to nominate a special father in your life for your chance to win. Just click the link in the chat. In honor of his current series, Pastor Ron is giving away copies of his book, The Necessity of an Enemy. For your chance to win, go to roncarpenter.com slash enemies. We want to honor our graduates in the month of June as they finish one season and enter into the next. But today is the last day to register your grad, so don't forget to do so by registering online at myredemption.cc slash events. If you want to download Pastor Ron's message for free, you can. All you have to do is go to roncarpenter.com slash message to get the download. And if today's worship experience blessed you, please consider supporting the ministry by giving. You can do so by visiting roncarpenter.com to give and to learn more about us. We are so grateful that you chose to join us today, and we'll see you next week right here on iChurch Live.